Ladies and gentlemen, let's start the first uh, session of our conference. In this session, we'll hear from four speakers. Over to the moderator, Professor Dariusz Pierzchoła. Ladies and gentlemen, I have an honor and pleasure to start this session devoted to the role of AI in cyber protection. I'm a representative of the cybernetics department of the Military University of Technology. And it is for a reason that I'm saying where I come from. 80 years ago to the day, two scientists, Warren McCulloch, a cyberneticist, and uh, Walter Pitts, a cognitivist, started a journey marking milestones in the development of AI. They started with publishing a, a model of a neural network in 1943, and the rest is history, showing years of fast growth intertwined with years of failures. Well, this uh, debate uh, pertains to unexplained uh, phenomena we try to emulate quite selectively. We've uh, witnessed uh, many breakthrough inventions in the past years. Like we had in the plenary session, the most important things are yet to come. But um, right here, right now, we are going to listen to eight expert speeches with a break after four, and then a debate with questions from the audience, time permitting. We are going to look at the most state-of-the-art uh, established uh, methods uh, of AI used for cybersecurity, which is, after all, the light motive of this conference. So, ladies and gentlemen, in the first part of this session, we'll have a unique opportunity to hear what AI is, now, then about uh, the benefits um, from uh, collaboration between humans and intelligent uh, machines and about uh, war games. We'll talk about um, security and insecurity or threats related to AI uh, caused by humans using it. And last but not least, uh, we'll hear how humans Uh, are creative in uh, uh, making new threats. Before I introduce the first speaker, let me tell you that uh, uh, the time slots are not more than 25 minutes because we planned uh, a 30 minute long break at 1 p.m. And then we'll have to wrap up the session uh, um, at the same time as the session upstairs uh, at um, half past three. After uh, each session, there'll be some time for questions and some other questions can be asked in the lobbies and the rest can be uh, sent in via uh, emails. So let's have the first lecture. What is AI? Delivered by uh, Dr. Piotr Bielski, a professor at the Warsaw University of Technology. He'll talk about uh, AI and expert systems and machine uh, learning. He'll talk about uh, um, concluding based on data and knowledge. He'll also talk about methods of uh, eliciting knowledge from data delivered. He'll use some cases of algorithms used uh, for problem solving in uh, uh, science and technology. Over to you, Professor.
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for inviting me here and uh, for introducing me. I'm Piotr Bilski, as you already know, and I come from the Warsaw University of Technology. This is the agenda of uh, my presentation. Well, uh, it's quite difficult to talk about it because the title is suggestive of uh, a very serious lecture on principles of AI, um, but I only have 25 minutes, so I have to be brief. Well, in general, I'd like to point out some most interesting aspects around uh, AI. Well, AI is ubiquitous, everybody talks about it, and so um, in uh, the world of uh, science and research, uh, this is uh, the term that opens many uh, um, doors, hearts and wallets, and for all the right reasons. But I do believe that the term is also abused uh, more frequently than not. This is about me. I'm a representative of the Institute of, of, Institute of Radio Electronics and uh, Media t uh, Technology. I'm the deputy director for uh, scientific uh, aspects of the department. And I've been dealing with AI for over 20 years now. But this was not my primary research objective. It was rather a tool I started using because originally I dealt with uh, what's called the diagnostics of analog systems. It's very much like medical diagnostics, only your object is not a dog or a human, but uh, rather a machine or, in, or an electronic uh, system. But as it turns out, AI comes in very handy in this field of research. And now I use and develop various AI methods in uh, the multimedia realm in general. In my unit, which is called um, electroacoustics unit, so I also deal with the sound and uh, more about it later. So what is artificial intelligence in the first place, just in a nutshell. It is a, a certain branch of science related to thinking machines, or as well defined thinking. In general, it all started with a very noble objective to build a in a self-aware, human-like thinking machine. I can give you examples of, uh, for example, the Terminator or Command Data System America, so Android's machines that uh, a lot of you know. And these are machines that are aware of their existence and they are thinking themselves and so this is tr strong AI that I am not dealing with actually this is more advanced artificial intelligence or a sub branch of this uh, science field so uh, we think that maybe those machines would have feelings maybe we could uh, chat with them maybe uh, it could be self-aware But the stimulus to the development actually was concentrated on these kind of machines, even though terminators could just exterminate us. But it's very attractive to human beings, a very attractive concept. But actually, what we are dealing with while talking about artificial intelligence today uh, is a series of algorithms that help us solve problems. We have uh, hundreds of thousands of problems to solve, so there are hundreds of thousands of methods of solving those problems, but it turns out that there are center, certain patterns in solving problems, so we use these patterns to build these algorithms and then we have new problems, some new problems emerge, so we uh, 
develop new solutions. And this is what development of artificial intelligence means. From the technological and also philosophical point of view, today I'm not going to deal with philosophical aspect because this is not my specialization. I'm more focused on technology. A large part of artificial intelligence is based on biology. So the fascination with biology developed a lot of algorithms of artificial intelligence. Why? Because well, we have human brain, which still uh, is an unraveled mystery, an unraveled uh, mysterious computer, a totally different computer that we are building today. And we try to shadow it a little bit or to map it to some extent. And then it turns out uh, in the course of our work that uh, our brain helps us solve certain problems that we uh, would never be able to solve uh, with using some other approaches, more based on machines. And we are also working on algorithms that are inspired by uh, groups of uh, organisms. It may be ants, it, ants, it may be birds or fish that have heard behaviors and we can see that for example one singular ant is not that very intelligent but when it works in a group the whole group behaves in a very intelligent way so this also was an inspiration for developing certain artificial intelligence algorithms but i would like to stress that when we are talking about artificial intelligence, then this natural intelligence is extremely important here. And I'm not only talking about individual intelligence by an individual human being, dolphin or chimpanzee, but also cooperation of simple organisms that at first sight are not that very smart, but when they start cooperating, they are very successful in achieving great results. Here, I try to name the main fields of artificial intelligence, groups of methods of algorithms that we can try to develop and apply. Generally, when it comes to artificial intelligence in the third decade of 21st century that we are living in now, we can say that this is already an old technology because it is as old as computers are. So it is about 80 years old. So it has already had its ups and downs. So when we hear today that our opportunities are great, immense, what will happen in one year, we cannot even imagine that. But I'm very careful about thinking about that because I have heard many times that we are on the verge of a breakthrough point, uh, etc., that artificial intelligence algorithms would uh, finally be super intelligent. So uh, I'm very careful about that because maybe one day we are able to build uh, such artificial intelligence tools that would be super intelligent, but as for now, I don't think so. Well, I may be wrong, but I don't think so for now. So these fields uh, have their um, common denominators. They are overlapping a little bit, but these are actually just groups of methods and applications of artificial intelligence. Again, we should actually try to answer the question what knowledge actually is. And from the perspective of our AI, it also depends, the definition of knowledge also depends on uh, our approach. And uh, we have heard a lot about artificial neural networks, deep neural networks, and their knowledge uh, is defined as interconnections between the computing units. Here we have some typical problems that are to be used uh, and are to be solved by artificial intelligence. I'm sorry in advance if you find some uh, typos here, but I hope that you understand my general intention. So we have certain problems that we try to solve with the use of artificial intelligence. So for example, classification of objects on the basis of characteristics that we feed to artificial intelligence tools. So we try to 
for example, differentiate between the car makes or persons on pictures or uh, some musical uh, works. So we are also searching for the best solutions from all um, possible and this is searching, this browsing. So for example, we want to get to a destination located on the other side of Warsaw and we ask the artificial intelligence tool to find the more optimal route. So this would be optimization, regression. This is another problem that we try to uh, solve with artificial intelligence. So for example, based on the temperature and uh, air pressure, I want to try to find a third parameter, any parameter that we can search for these interconnections between the input and output, and also grouping of data. It's another problem that we want to solve. We have, for example, a lot of data and we want to find the relations between this data. We want to group them and then use this data uh, effectively. We have heard a lot about machine learning. It's a paradigm of acquir acquiring knowledge from data because algorithms do need data. Of course, there are some algorithms that work without any data, with zero knowledge, so to say. But in the majority of cases, especially when we talk about deep neural networks, when you want those tools to work effectively, first we have to feed it with data. So if a person, if a human being um, wants to learn something, he or she needs data and find the relations between them and then uh, they learn. So when we want a person to learn comics, then that person needs to know what uh, those car makes look like and then can learn to differentiate between them. And this is a similar method here. So we can uh, teach those neural networks uh, in, by way of supervised learning or unsupervised learning. In gaming, we have supervised learning. So for example, we want to learn how to play chess uh, or checkers. And first, we try to make some moves. We don't know if they are good or bad, but when we reach the end of the game and we lose, then we know that our decisions were bad. And then we can learn on our mistakes from our mistakes and we can um, improve our gaming skills uh, later. We also have other methods, for example, uh, when there is one problem, artificial intelligence tool can solve one problem, but it cannot solve another problem. So for example, with ChatGPT, um, example, it would mean that we can chat with ChatGPT, but it will not bring um, us a beer. So it would not solve our problem of not having beer to drink right now. And we have different types of data. We have uh, images, we have videos, we have musical works, or these can be vectors of numbers that mean something. They can describe process, for example, and usually we look at a table. I don't know if you can see this table, or maybe not. But we have a table which has rows or lines, so, and these are examples. There are certain numbers in each of the line, and these are attributes. These attributes mean different things depending on the application, and the whole thing is about providing this data, then working on a method that would extract this data, which can be defined as knowledge. And then when we have this knowledge, we can apply it for drawing conclusions. That's it. There's one thing here to remember. So there's a, a, a GIDO paradigm, so garbage in, garbage out. So we have to prepare really good data. It's not like we can provide garbage data and then expect great results. No, first we have to work very hard in order to adjust the data 
to solving our problem, and then we can teach the tool to solve that problem. There is a concept of Occam Razor. It's a concept um, that emerged in the Middle Ages, actually, but we also apply it to artificial intelligence development. It actually means that we cannot complicate things in order to get the best results. So these are complicated things themselves. So if we want them to be effective and useful, then we cannot make them even more complicated. So, so that we get understandable results, or even if we cannot understand the results, we can apply them, we can use them. And we want to differentiate two ca categories of objects. For example, we have white and orange objects, and we want to um, differentiate between them uh, based on the two features. We, we provide the data of those two features, the colors, and then we want to uh, get the classification of them based on the color and uh, to the left we can see that the uh, whites are to the left and the oranges are to the right so we can very easily divide this data differentiate between them and we are very happy about this situation because it's easy to uh, do but Unfortunately, life isn't that simple. Very often, our problems are more complex, and the data that we deal with is not that organized very well. And it is very easy to make mistakes. So, how to differentiate between those two uh, colored elements? Should we just go along the straight line? and uh, make mistakes or should we find a complicated solution here to differentiate between the white and orange colors so uh, very often we rather resort to simple solutions in acoustics we have electronical system which helps us find which element is responsible for a certain behavior and it turns out that a lot of elements behave in a way that they look similarly uh, in the output data and then uh, we can see that these uh, two groups of data are overlapping so we get a, gra a group of data which is not unambiguous. We also get some noise but if we are able to already find these relations, find these features, then we actually come up with certain knowledge and then we can use this knowledge to make decisions based on uh, this data. And this is how expert systems are built. Actually, today, any system that helps us make decisions can be called expert systems. In the past, uh, they were unique. So, Actually, where do system, um, expert systems draw their knowledge from? Actually, there has to be a human expert who feeds the machine. And we have to remember that knowledge is dependent on the method, and we also have to remember that the uh, learning process and drawing conclusion process is not that simple. So the first process takes time, but when the machine already has learned, then it can just work online and make individual decisions and it saves us the time. So we have to devote a lot of time at the beginning to teach the machine. When it comes to the artificial neural in networks and artificial intelligence, we have to remember about the black box paradigm. So the machine is taught, it takes decisions which are more or less correct, but we have no idea why it takes such decisions. Is it a problem for us, actually? Well, according to research on neural networks, it's not a problem because it works and that's what it's all about. And that's great, because we don't understand how our brains work, so, um, and we don't have problems with that. As long as it functions well, we don't care how actually it happens. So this knowledge that is extracted, it actually doesn't have to be 
understood by uh, the human beings. So the process of generating such knowledge does not have to be understood. We just want to apply this knowledge, but we don't care how these decisions are taken. However, in the expert systems, the clarifying module has always been important, but here in neural networks is not important. We have loads of algorithms in artificial intelligence. I don't want to talk about all of them, but here is just a short list of different methods. And we can use these methods because they are already there. We don't have to write new algorithms. We, we just pick one and use them. When we use, for example, data analysis or neural network, we uh, describe what each uh, method entails, and then the person who wants to use this artificial intelligence knows which to pick. So this is our inventory. For example, decision making trees. It looks like a tree, and actually, we have the data at the beginning, so at the roots, and then this uh, data is then analyzed and we have leaves. So we have different leaves and this is called a rule method. So it's actually um, based on common sense. If uh, there are certain prerequisites, then I make a decision and that's it. So in the 60s and 70s, it was very popular, prologue or list uh, were even um, programming languages that were built based on this methodology and everyone was sure that this is how we're going to build these intelligent machines, but then it turned out that it is not that simple, but they are really effective in solving simple problems. But it's also easy to understand how to how they work. But on the other hand, we have neural networks. So they are actually combined algorithms the, which are based on the connections between computing units. And this is the most important thing about neural networks. We have here also feedback loops that can generate memories. So those chat GPTs and other methods that are, for example, generating new images based on those that they have already seen. This will be it. Actually, only a bit more complicated. Here I have a slide about deep neural networks because right now everybody is uh, very much interested in developing those because they prove to be effective. So here we have a, a graphic card NVIDIA, of course. Uh, it's graphic only by name, uh, it's not a graphic tool, but it can uh, compute, it, it can process the data and you don't have to do anything with it, we, it processes images and that is why we use them for processing images. Now, to conclude, I would like to show you two examples of applications. I talk about it with my PhD students. Here uh, we have a mechanism that is used in, in the, uh, bicycles, and we can hear a certain sound when uh, this wheel is turning, and it depends on the construction of the system. So we can, for example, uh, change the location of particular elements of this wheel and then the sound will be different. We uh, very often will not detect the difference in the sound, but the machines can do it and sometimes just by this sound only, the machine could tell us where a given element is located and uh, maybe there is a problem with the location of the element so the uh, services of bicycles could use it in repairing bicycles. Here we have another example of building a secure uh, a communications, long distance communication system with energy sparing systems like for instance the use of chaotic networks. It's a kind of neural network uh, representing pseudo-random sequence dynamics. 
uh, which are very good for generating keys so that the network nodes recognize each other. And, uh, there was research made on um, some very small computers behind it. To sum it all up, because I think this is the end of my time slot, over this very short slot, I try to tell you more about what AI is uh, from uh, the more engineering perspective, things based on things we do day in, day out without the philosophical background. Clearly, we've got many methods out there. Data are still very important and you have to be wise and selecting them and it takes some computing power. We are trying to increase it, but uh, so far it can be a limitation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Just a short comment. It's really fascinating how, operate, how operating studies are giving way to AI after the Second World War. And the taxonomy you showed in the first slides clearly shows that what we knew as studies is now AI. We only have time for one very short question from the audience. Over to you. I wanted to ask you about the penultimate paragraph of the last slide, the complexity. Could you please explain it? You mentioned increasing complexity. Computing complexity as a theoretical term from theoretical IT. Speaking of uh, how much the computing intensity should grow if the problem grows. Like, for instance, if, if we increase the problem twice, if we double the problem, do we need a double computing uh, uh, power? If so, it's very good because it means uh, linear complexity according to the uh, theory of algorithms. But well, I didn't mention it, but in the case of many problems we tackle, the problems are so huge that uh, uh, you could have the most powerful computers and still you couldn't find the solution uh, in uh, uh, a foreseeable time. That's why we are talking the heuristic way. Like, for instance, if I want to uh, get from here uh, to another place in Warsaw, there might be many routes. If uh, we have um, uh, if we have tens of thousands of routes, it means that uh, the complexity describes how difficult the problem is and how effective the algorithm tackling the problem is. With a certain size of the problem, like for instance, let's take a size of 10, I can uh, solve it in a matter of an hour. But if it's 20, not 10, does it mean that I need two hours or one month? It's quite important, not uh, from the practical perspective, but uh, for stating how difficult our problems are to solve. And there's a different IT track to tackle it related to quantum physics. The quantum computers, once you build them, they might change the computing complexity of algorithms and even problems. So implementing them can totally change the gravity of the problems we are solving. Thank you. Sometimes you hear that quantum computers won't change the complexity, but just accelerate uh, the, uh, uh, the computing, but uh, apparently in not all classes of problems. Thank you. Now on to another lecture, uh, Human and AI, a War Games, delivered by Professor Krzysztof Jasem from Adam Mickiewicz University in Poznań. Over to you, Professor. Uh, the, in the lecture, we'll see the backstage of the conflict between humans and AI uh, happening before our very eyes. On the one hand, the humans are ever better at creating ever more perfect algorithms for AI. Uh, but, on the other hand, AI interferes uh, with human life, breaching privacy, breaching uh, copyright, and, according to the last reports, taking away our jobs. Over to you, Professor.
Thank you very much for this introduction. Humans and uh, AI, war games. Well, uh, I wondered how to uh, uh, title my presentation to attract uh, physicists uh, in this conference. If I um, if I uh, titled it human and humans and AI legal aspects, I could see well three or so lawyers here. But uh, if uh, you are here, it means that you're interested, and it will I'll be a few slides into my presentation before you realize that I won't be talking about any war. After what uh, we heard so far. Um, some of what I'm going to say will be a repetition or rephrasing. Well, at the beginning I was a bit concerned about it, but I once talked to this uh, musicology, music theorist friend who uh, told me that uh, people uh, like best the melodies they already had before. And it's best uh, that it's not a plagiarism, but something similar to what they heard before. So uh, maybe this will be the case of my presentation. It will be similar, but a bit different, and it will uh, uh, make you like it. So humans and AI, war games. This is a cybersecurity conference. What is cybersecurity then? It's a set of processes and tech solutions for protecting computer systems from cyber attacks. So. If we speak about AI and cybersecurity, we mean two aspects. Using AI for cyber attacks and using AI for protecting against them. I'm going to focus on the latter in this presentation but I'm not going to talk about tech solutions because in the definition of uh, AI, apart from technology, there's something about processes. So I'm going to focus on processes of um, defending again computers against cyber attacks and using AI in them. I'm going to talk about processes and legal solutions. So in the military lingo, you could say that in my presentation, AI will be offensive and the humans will be defensive. That's why I titled it, titled it War Games. Uh, well, I cannot hear uh, any applause, so maybe you're not buying the title of my presentation all that much. Thank you very much. Now. I have to play the war game with the slide clicker. This is the agenda of my presentation. How do we perceive AI? What it is? And then humans and AI. And surprise, surprise, I'm going to mention China then uh, humans and AI in Europe, no surprises here, and then the summary, who's winning? I hope you'll bear with me until this part. So let's start with how humans perceive uh, AI. Frequently, we perceive it f uh, from the perspective of literature and art, like for instance, movies about AI. In the previous presentation, you saw some pics from uh, the movies about AI. Uh, take the Minority Report, my favorite AI movie. AI in this movie is a mechanism of uh, preventing future crimes that are already just that are just budding in human heads. Also. If you watched it, you know that AI is used for biometric uh, authentication using your no, iris. In the Terminator, AI is like a deadly weapon. We are so scared of AI there. 
And then it's even more scary in the matrix, where AI takes over the power and uses humans as a source of energy. How worse can it, uh, it, can it get? In AI, AI is not that scary because it's trying to become human. And then uh, let's take this episode of uh, Black Mirror Nosedive, where uh, AI appraises people using the appraisal system. This is what we do. Uh, we uh, like evaluating and grading teachers and doctors. We don't like being evaluated all that much, though. And then another case from the same show quite scary, to me at least, AI impersonates uh, a person that's close to the protagonist. And then in Men Against Fire, uh, it was very impressive, it, it was very realistic. In that movie, AI created virtual reality for soldiers who put on special VR masks to think that they are fighting uh, scary monsters. It made them lose any empathy and then they had uh, no problems with eliminating the threat. But in reality, as it turns out, the brutal monsters were helpless, unarmed people. To sum it up, the majority of movies and, uh, in general, art depicts AI as something that might scare us, mainly because at some point we, the humans, lose control over it, and this is what we are afraid of most. So, Where's the fine line between science fiction and reality? What is AI? Encyclopedia Britannica comes up with quite a general definition, saying that it's an ability of robots or computers, IT systems in general, to perform tasks that are usually associated with um, intelligent uh, uh, beings, most frequently humans. But let's have a look. Does it correlate with our intuition? Let's take some examples. A calculator. What do you use it for? Well, for calculations, which is something usually done by humans. Is this AI? According to the definition, it should be, but our intuition is that it's not. Or a crane, once uh, built by humans, now built by machines. But this is still not AI, according to our gut feeling. Let's take lasers, like, for instance, laser eye surgery. This is high tech, but Still, it does what humans wanted to do with simple tools originally. But it's just a better tool to perform a, a surgery. So we won't say it's AI. Or let's take this tool, uh, learning how to translate using well-known text, or let's take an autonomous vehicle or chat GPT. By our intuition, it is AI. So what is the difference between the bottom cases and the upper cases? It seems that in this day and age, we think AI is whatever can be defined by machine learning. So we tend to think that AI is a set of operations resulting in improvement of our actions along with uh, um, more and more data available. Both graphs 
show the difference between standard programming and AI-based programming. In the first case, we have a certain baseline data and an algorithm we create, giving us a certain result. And in the case on the right, we get an algorithm based on the data, and then the algorithm can uh, um, work on its own. Let me get a bit more precise about what AI is. It seems that nowadays AI is defined in terms of uh, machine uh, learning. Also, it's not the matrix. It's not the system that's outside our control. It's rather a system created and started by humans. It simulates uh, human actions, but in a very specific task or set of, set of tasks. We say that AI is learning. If it does not improve along with the inflowing data, it's not of use. It's not learning. Then we won't say that it meets the condition of machine learning, which is a sine qua non condition to say that a certain solution is indeed AI. How to check then whether AI is learning? Uh, we check whether a student is learning by asking questions and based on answers, we grade the knowledge. Similarly with AI, we use certain metrics to evaluate the level of AI. A metric is a certain mathematical formula resulting in a number. Uh, usually, for the sake of better interpretations, somewhere between zero and one. So if we compare the two systems performing uh, respectively A and B tasks, the results might differ, but since the metrics are different, it's hard to say which of the two systems is better. However, if we compare two systems performing the same tasks using a certain metrics of evaluation, we can say that system A is better than B because uh, the metric uh, gives better results. Using metrics, we can also uh, say when a system is learning, because if we uh, have a system with more information and uh, the metrics are growing, so the system improved, we can then say that this system is a learning one. How to evaluate the system? What kind of metrics are we using and uh, where to take them from? The metrics are uh, dependent upon the tasks performed by AI, and there are many types of them. Let me give you just two. The first one consists in comparing the AI with humans in action, like, for instance, in image recognition. We ask AI to tell us whether there's a dog in the picture. And then we prepare a certain uh, golden rule, a certain set of data. And then the uh, human uh, says that uh, there is a dog in 10 pictures and t 10 images, and there is uh, uh, no uh, there are no dogs in uh, uh, the other 10. And then we check it with the AI, and the compliance is called the metrics. Or we can compare it with real data. Like, for instance, we ask AI to uh, forecast um, the uh, share price. Well, uh, there are many such systems out there competing with each other on the market. And in order to check how well the system works, we check it against real data. So we go back in time in the system. It's 2023, and we go back to 2022 and say, well, imagine it's July 2022. Use uh, uh, data until June 2022, 
and uh, tell us what happens in July 2022. The system does it for us, and since it's 2023 already, we check it with what really happened in July 2022. I hope that I managed to convince you at least a little bit that artificial intelligence is almost a synonym of machine learning and also past uh, summits uh, concerning artificial intelligence. And now I would like to present to you another myth that I would like to argue with. Yesterday I heard yet another time during a lecture uh, to which I listened that artificial intelligence is very quickly developed in China uh, due to the fact that they have no limits and everything goes there. I agree with the first part of this thesis so, uh, that China is a leader of artificial intelligence development, but I disagree with the second part of this thesis saying that they base their development on the lack of limitations. Quite the contrary, China is the first country in the world that introduced a legal policy regulating artificial intelligence. And in a moment, I will try to substantiate my thesis. In 2018, China uh, developed the plan of AI technology development. On the one hand, it was an incentive to develop AI technology. On the other hand, back then, China already wanted to close the concept of AI in a certain scheme. Then the ethical norms was, uh, were developed for artificial intelligence and they decided that people should retain control. Control is, the, I think, the most important keyword in artificial intelligence. And in uh, December 2021, also in China, a regulation was introduced that imposed the obligation of controlling the content generated by AI. And please note that ChatGPT was not developed yet back then. And also, they created the policy of protecting people against uh, unlegal uses of uh, artificial intelligence. We are now in November 2022. ChatGPT already emerges and they introduced a ban on generating fake news, obligation of marking the contents generated by artificial intelligence. 11th April of 2023, management of services generating um, AI contents, it, which said that all the contents has to be uh, true. And then they also made the regulation more precise. It's all in China. So now let's go back to Europe. In 2018, we started one year later because China started in 2017. So in 2018, we in Europe developed the plan of developing AI. In April 2021, there was the first proposition of regulating artificial intelligence contents. Only then we adopted common approach to artificial intelligence in 2023. 20, we only uh, at adopted AI Act, well, actually, it has not yet come into force. Actually, it's not adopted, it is being worked on. The Council and the Parliament of the European Union are still working on this Act. It has 200 pages and it is aimed at aligning the contents of artificial intelligence with the applicable laws right now. Protection. We can hear protection here. We should be protected against artificial intelligence applications. It's uh, something related to cybersecurity. It's a process that is supposed to protect us against artificial intelligence. 
In AI Act, we can see three types of systems that are described there. So, for example, uh, subliminal techniques, biometric identification, and also high-risk systems. For example, systems of managing critical infrastructure, but also systems deciding on um, granting access to education. So we cannot use artificial intelligence algorithms when accepting students to universities. And there is a special paragraph about systems generating content, for example, ChatGPT. There are also limitations on such tools listed there. So we have to be aware that we uh, read gener artificially generated content. And when we create content with this of AI, we also have to mark it. And the system generating AI content needs to inform us about its sources while preparing such content. Now, let's have a look at whether the existing systems are in line with those uh, regulations. A group of scientists from Stanford took 10 systems generating content similar to ChatGPT because ChatGPT is only one of them. And they looked at the Open AI Act, an AI Act and they extracted 12 articles just focusing on generating the contents and they checked how those 10 systems are in line with those regulations. So when we take GPT-4 in its latest version, then we can see that out of 48 conditions, only 12 conditions are fulfilled uh, in their entirety. The best result is 36 out of 48. So what's the conclusion? None of the existing systems are in line with these regulations. So when the act enters into force in 2024, then either we will not be able to use those systems or we will have to break the law if we want to use those systems. In 2022, in um, Adam Mickiewicz University, a center of artificial intelligence was established that I'm ahead of. Our objective is to do research on artificial intelligence, implement our conclusions to economy, cooperate with other universities. But we also thought that we want to follow our mission, which is propagating the development of artificial intelligence that are not at war with human being, but that are friends with human being. So the systems that are generated based on OpenAI Act. And I want to show you a system that we uh, think about here. The, it resembles us of Google, and but it is addressed to physicians. So a physician can search for content and then uh, get some answers with sources marked. But the difference is that the system that we are working on provides information only from reliable and checked sources. And first and foremost, from the sources that have been authorized by their authors. So the authors granted their consent to be quoted by the system. Now, conclusion. Who is about to win this war? I would like to show a short video and here for 12 seconds we can see cars moving at the speed of 30 to 40 kilometers per hour and at what speed they would be able to uh, go they would be able to go at the speed of 300 kilometers per hour even because the technology allows us to do it so why aren't they speeding because the human has realized what 
risks uh, those cars would pose if we drove them at high speeds. People could die. So again, artificial technology is merely a technology, a technology that we human beings have to face. And similarly to cars, we have to try regulate it with certain legal documents, legal regulations. And I would like to draw a conclusion because my time is uh, up nearly. But on the 1st and 2nd November in London, the Prime Minister of Great Britain organized AI Safety Summit, focusing on safety of artificial intelligence, of course. So we have seen a lot of summits focusing on climate change, but this new summit was attended by 20, uh, representatives of 28 countries. Elon Musk was there and uh, Prime Minister Sunak talked to Elon Musk. It was very interesting. You can check that online. And this summit is an yet another step confirming that we humans, we already are aware that this is a technology that we have to uh, protect ourselves from and we have to regulate it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor, for casting some light also on the formalities and on the legal aspects of developing artificial intelligence. Now we have time for one short question from the audience. I don't think there are any questions from the others, so I would like to ask one. Do you think, Professor, that everything that is going on around us, and you have been commenting on that, will force us to live in, uh, in synergy with artificial intelligence, whereby the artificial intelligence may be difficult to Regulate. Yes, we will live in synergy with artificial intelligence. Similarly to um, other technologies, we live in symbiosis in synergy with all other technologies. So why even talk here about being forced to live in synergy? Uh, we will want to live in synergy with them. I would like to. Uh, go back to the summit organized in November and I could see that Poland was not present there. There were uh, people from all the countries, well, a lot of countries, but um, we should think about it. Why Poland was absent at the summit gathering 28 countries developing artificial intelligence. Of course, China was present there, the US was there, but Poland was absent. Yes, that's something to think about. Thank you very much once again. Ladies and gentlemen, the next speaker is the Professor Jerzy Duda from AGH in Krakow. He will talk to us about the safety of artificial intelligence understood as the uh, artificial intelligence of possibility to act in line with our expectations and avoiding adverse effects. So we are going to talk about uh, ethics, the security, and based on the latest research, as well as existing solutions and strategies aiming at providing security of artificial intelligence. Professor stresses that it is key to raising awareness of artificial intelligence and understanding the problem. Professor, the floor is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, first and foremost, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me here today. I hope it is not the last time that I would have the opportunity to talk to you. A lot of subjects have been already touched upon and I feel very much inspired. We have heard inspiration for cooperation between universities and we should really accentuate 
our presence at such for a, as, uh, for example, the summit in Bechley that uh, took place recently. Professor Jerzy Mikulik, professor of the AGH, is the co-author of my presentation. How do I control the presentation? Oh yes, długą stronę. Okay, mało intuicyjnie, ale to może też jakiś system bezpieczeństwa. Okay. Okay, now I can see my slide. So what is artificial intelligence? We have heard certain definitions a lot of times today already, so I would not like to repeat myself. Well, I have been dealing with AI for 30 years, maybe I don't look like that, but uh, I have started early during my master's program and I'm still into that. I am more and more fascinated about going beyond certain borders, breaking limits. OpenAI showed us with their G chat GPT that we can break an yet another barrier. I really wouldn't have believed that some years ago, but now it's possible. I asked ChatGPT how it would define artificial intelligence, and it, it's, and it is similar to the definition by a professor. So this is a field of science technology that deals with creating machines and systems that can solve problems based on human intellect. It's a safe definition, but the question is what human intellect is. So to dig up a ditch, you also need to have certain level of intelligence. You have to know what type of tool, uh, tools you have to use and how to do it more effectively. But the question is what level of intelligence is actually needed to do that? Nowadays, each field of our life can see some interventions of artificial intelligence, first and foremost in business. I cooperate with a lot of companies in Poland, and everybody is asking me about the possibilities of using artificial intelligence to solve any problem there is, whether they want to optimize their processes or detect certain defects or problems in the production process. So actually, business perceives artificial intelligence as a remedy for everything, a silver pill. So you can actually do it because we have dancing robots, we have ChatGPT writing novels. Based on that assumptions, people think that they can solve anything, any problem. For example, OpenAI uh, can also create works of art that can be mistaken by uh, people with a uh, work of art of a human being. So why wouldn't we use it to solve any other problem? In cultural, well, we have already talked about that. AI is very success, has been very successful in this field, of course. A lot of institutions and governments try to secure people and their intellectual property rights against actions of artificial intelligence. Maybe it will be one of the barriers that would stop a little bit the development of what um, of artificial intelligence, what was also commented on by professor in his speech. Of course, there will be more and more restrictions and limitations, which will be able to block a little bit the development of AI. Medicine, medical sciences. Uh, well, after a simple imaging or simple signals, right now we do not have the, an AI tool that would uh, correctly diagnose a disease and provide the treatment for a patient. 
some system, such systems are being built out there, but some years ago at the New York University, we heard that it's, it's only a thing of the future. Uh, also, uh, because of uh, the data access. Now, let's take education. Here, too, we, like in the realm of marketing, marketing one to one, we say that it's all about education one to one. So the role of the teacher will be a role of a mentor, whereas education will be uh, tailor made. Uh, uh, to the needs on the perception level and the interest of a student, also to the things they might want to do in the future. And then last but not least, uh, security. That's uh, why we are here in the first place, because of cyber security. Virtually all systems built for cyber security use some elements of AI to filter out uh, throngs of data and uh, signal certain uh, rare events uh, that need uh, researching. Well, of course, the threat is that AI might overlook something or give us false negatives, but uh, it's uh, a matter of uh, studying the systems and securing them against uh, false negatives. I put it on a separate slide uh, on purpose because the most spectacular failures of AI you can read in day-to-day newspapers are related to the world of autonomous driving. This is um, a timeline of development of autonomous uh, transportation. We know that we already have some trials of uh, cyber taxis. Recently, I went to Bangkok and I saw some autonomous vehicles uh, uh, test driven on roads there. However, uh, reality and law permitting, we think in 2040 we should uh, have uh, autonomous vehicles uh, authorized uh, for day-to-day -day traffic. When I was preparing this presentation, I looked up some cases and examples of independent systems used in uh, autonomous vehicles. And I uh, uh, found a study of 11 months showing 400 uh, collisions over that time span. Let's take another case. There was uh, an accident in South Korea where a machine failed to recognize a worker, treated him as a box to be put on the conveyor belt, and sadly the worker in question did not survive. Well, it might not be a good example, though it was widely publicized because the, uh, but the role of the cobot is not recognition of uh, large objects, but rather recognition of uh, shape and making movements. So, uh, uh, the intelligence of that cobot is limited. Okay, some statistics now. 35% of major American companies uh, are already using AI. 77% of uh, more sophisticated devices use uh, certain form of embedded uh, AI. 9 out of 10 organizations uh, support implementation of AI because this is what the uh, competitors do. 
After generative AI came, or chat GPT for you, 77% uh, of uh, top managers uh, say that it will, it will have the biggest influence on their companies out of all new technologies. And over 92% of respondents in, among top management in the, in the US think that the risk is high or moderate. So, is AI secure? This is the question for us to answer. We should ask uh, not only what AI can do for cybersecurity, but also what cybersecurity can or should do for AI to for it to be used uh, in a proper manner. Let's start uh, by quoting John Graham Cummings' work. He is known uh, as the one uh, petitioning the uh, UK government to apologize to Alan Turing for the way he was treated. Uh, treated back in the day, and he also um, created some uh, adaptive uh, anti-spam uh, filters. Also, in 2004, he showed that um, such a seemingly sophisticated and intelligent filter can be cheated by implementing an additional mechanism. It's quite significant from the perspective of uh, attacks on AI. Let's now talk about adversarial examples. They can have many names in Polish, but in English we are talking about adversarial attacks or possibly about adversarial machine learning. So it was shown that uh, um, well-trained anti-spam filters can be cheated if we add some good words to them. And then they start treating the potential spam as uh, not the spam. Twenty twelve was a very important year. We already said that um, AI is for the most part about deep uh, neural networks now. They have huge uh, possibilities because we can feed such a system with lots of data and it can act very universal. In 2012, Alex Kryzinewski on the 30th of uh, uh, September 2012 uh, uh, presented AlexNet showing that the deep neural network can be better than any other solution, in this case and classifying images, better by over 10 percent. It came as a shock for the world of science and it marked the beginning of yet another spring of AI. Like we said in the panel, some were concerned that uh, we uh, might be approaching another AI winter that uh, 
we satisfied all practical uh, aspects of AI, and we are witnessing another winter of it. But some others say that we are uh, nowhere near that. This uh, network shows that we can build very effective classifiers irrespective of the features uh, fed in. So, in a natural, neural, the neural networks uh, uh, all by themselves selected the features allowing them to classify images in certain groups. Before that, uh, it called for some separate actions. Unfortunately, in the very same year, Batista Biggio showed that the problem of uh, cheating uh, AI is not only related to linear models like anti spam filters, but also non linear models like uh, uh, support vector machines. Next year, Segedi and uh, our very own Wojciech Zaremba the co-author and co-owner of OpenAI and others and their article showed that this is the way to deceive a deep a convolutive network. You just put in some modified data and then the network starts giving uh, wrong answers. These are some examples we saw in the previous presentations. They, the authors used the uh, right noise to arrive at the, the ostrich, whatever the baseline image was. And they showed that uh, it's quite a simple thing to do. Then, a year later, Goodfellow came up with an even simpler method. Called a fast gradient sign method. Well, there are over 50 methods like that discussed uh, in the literature. They are all out of the box ones and they can be used uh, to generate. Uh, a, uh, a small noise for an image or any other stream to uh, deceive uh, the previously trained classifier. So instead of panda, we end up with the recognition of a gibbon. To say more, even if you modify one pixel of an image, you can make a change. You don't need a very sophisticated noise. Uh, in order to arrive at uh, wrong classification, especially if your classifiers at the outset fail to classify our images unequivocally. Okay, I'd rather not go into details. There are many articles on uh, classifying adversarial attacks. It's quite a popular topic, even more popular after the great success of ChatGPT. But by and large, there are two types of attacks, black box and white box. In, in black box, we have knowledge of the model, just like in the cases I mentioned. By mathematical calculations, we can arrive at uh, an algorithm or we can teach a machine how to deceive a model and then the black box where we don't have this knowledge and then we can support the machine and challenge it. There are many ways to do it but in general we make queries uh, sending some images uh, for classification and reading the reaction of the classifier. The attacks can be targeted or non-targeted. We might want to attack the whole classifier so that it gives unreliable results, or we might want to just make it 
it'll recognize an image or a class of objects, like, for instance, admitting us into an ill-secured system by attacking the very weak spot of the system. These are examples of black box attacks. There's a simple security for that. Uh, we shouldn't uh, give uh, a too sophisticated answer so that the system does not learn. And then we should limit the number of queries for the system. There are various techniques. Protecting us if we are attackers from that as well. In this example, we have recognition of uh, uh, traffic signs and a case of a simple black box attack. And this, uh, there's a simple machine to generate such uh, attacks, and the authors. Uh, are showing how to make this machine ever more efficient. Uh, what's the defense against such attacks? It consists first and foremost on optimizing the model, uh, hiding the gradient, regulating the gradient so that the model acts more universal, not being uh, uh, that vulnerable to uh, special data points. So we have to protect the model. Then we optimize the data, which is um, consistent adversar adversarial uh, training. So we build a model trying to attack our model, and based on that, modify our model accordingly to be able to defend against such modified data, or we compress the features or reconstruct the entry. So we do not uh, act on the data, on the entry data, we rather modify them and the attacker doesn't know what the modification was like. And if it's uh, stochastic to boot, such an attack is uh, more difficult. But apart from adversarial attacks, we've got some other older types of attacks. You just have to have access to training data, or you just have to be able to influence the training data. So if we have generative AI like uh, ChatGPT learning from the internet in general terms, then we can manufacture huge uh, data farms. And any generative AI could use uh, the data to learn and then generate uh, responses accordingly. It's an ever recurrent topic, although it's one of the oldest types of attacks. So all in all, it consists in uh, um, uh, poisoning or spiking the data. We can uh, poison uh, labels, like in this picture, or um, certain uh, pieces of the image. And there are two other types of attacks popular nowadays. Namely, we want to know how the model works, especially in black box attacks. So we sample the model in order to learn uh, what the gradients are, what kind of a classifier it is, uh, what matter they are employing, is it collective uh, um, learning or um, transfer training. 
sorry, this is me and technology. I have to switch off my mobile. But it's clearly the signal to wrap up my presentation. And then we can reverse the mobile. So uh, uh, I can elicit the data used for training the mobile, like, for instance, for face recognition. OK, I'll skip the types and uh, the defense types because I'm uh, past my time slot already. But attacks on federation training federate or federated learning are very important. This is yet another stage of the development of AI in uh, the business community and in the military, like, for instance, in operating UAVs. It's about the collaboration of various clients keeping the data for training the model. Well, theoretically, this model seems more secure, but it is not in that it is not resistant to traditional attacks at all, and there are some further threats coming in. Last but not least, let me show you the timeline of uh, AI attacks. So we can see that this development is exponential because uh, deep neural networks emerge and then we can see the exponential growth. So each year AI archive uh, is attacked more than 1000 times. Very often these are more interesting attacks for us, so black box attacks without knowledge of the model. But what's positive here, only one-fourth of it, this data uh, relates not only to the attacks but uh, to the defensive actions with regard to those attacks. So whenever our system is attacked, we also get the information how to defend ourselves from those attacks. I will not now tell you how these concepts are related with each other. I would like to quickly relate to the previous speech. So for example, AI Act are the National Institute of Standards and Technology of the US Department of Commerce also have prepared the framework for building artificial intelligence so that it can be applied commercially in business. And declaration from Bletchley signed on the 1st of November 2023. Well, the fact is that Poland was absent there, but the European Union was represented there. So I hope and I want to believe that it was signed by the European Union only also with consultation with Poland. So I hope that in the future we'll be able to uh, join in to such events. We also have adversarial um, National Institute of Standards and Technology of US Department of Commerce. I already mentioned that we have European Union Agency for Cybersecurity. There are certain solutions prepared also by Google. I know that this tools are not yet finished, but they uh, give us idea what type of tools we should use in order to protect ourselves against the attacks. Thank you very much. And I open the floor for questions. Thank you very much. Professor, your material is very extensive and to, uh, we will prepare publication based on our conference and I hope that we will be able to uh, see your slides once again. So ladies and gentlemen, AI attack, uh, cyber attacks, uh, these are concepts that are used more often in the military aspect. The first wave is uh, CBR and E, uh, the massive mass destruction weapons, and the uh, third wave is now being realized that so this is the wave of cyber attacks. And I wanted now to relate to the uh, artificial intelligence attacks and cyber attacks that can interfere with the role of 
soldiers. I would like now to address the, the, our audience online. You will have the possibility to ask questions offline. Of course, right now uh, it's impossible, but after the, all the speeches, we'll be able to ask the questions. So your questions will be passed over to the speakers and I hope that you will receive your answers. So, one question that we received is, is a human being able to stop artificial intelligence, which is actually a dormant weapon and it can be used at any moment? Or maybe this weapon will be able to use itself autonomically through the war of algorithms or even wars of whole algorithms uh, of whole systems very interesting question is yes, of course we can apply hard barriers even during this panel we have heard that the final decision is still taken by a human being no matter what but of course the generic networks actually emerge from adversarial attacks. So one network that tries to resemble something that is real and the second network tries to assess whether uh, this network is real or not. But I wouldn't be afraid of artificial intelligence. Of course, the changes are all the faster because ChatGPT proved to be very successful. And based on that, the European Union and other institutions, even this global summit, decided that it's high time to act. We cannot wait any longer. We have to remember our, about our security, we have to provide legal frameworks. I skipped certain slides, but next to machine learning and deep learning, we have always had network security, so we have always had a protection of data and it is even more important right now than before and these protection systems are stronger. Thank you very much. Professor, well, we as soldiers are not afraid of anything, of course, and we are not afraid of artificial intelligence either because uh, it, we can also always use the last resort that is to just switch off the uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, I would like to thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I, and I'm sorry for not being at my full, not acting at my full potential. I'm a little bit. I have a cold. Now, the next question and the next speech will be delivered by a professor from University of Adam Mickiewicz in Poznań, um, Tomasz Kowalski, PhD. During the speech, we will have the opportunity of looking at offensive and defensive applications of artificial intelligence. Professor, the floor is yours. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. I am very pleased to be here today with us. I know that you have been listening attentively for one and a half hours. Even those who have been active in academia for years must be tired already, but I still hope that you will be able to follow my presentation. I would like to start with making two introductory comments. Well, taking into consideration a very dynamic development in artificial intelligence, something that used to be a scientific project and a research object today can already become a product. But I would like to reserve that this presentation is a scientific one. It is not an offer. It is not a commercial. I'm not selling anything today. And a second remark, I will try to present you with my conclusions, but I would like you to be able to draw the same conclusions with the use of open sources and 
any time when I would re uh, reverse, um, when I would refer to such source, I could just provide you with a link. So, almost each slide is equipped with QR code and Feel free to use your uh, mobile phones or any other tools to scan QR codes unless it is against the rules of this event, then please follow the rules of this event, but I don't mind. Of course, we are talking about security, so I would like to ensure you that the links uh, under the slides are not shortened, are not abbreviated, so maybe this will make you feel more safe to use them. And I believe that we have to be aware of threats and the ways of facing them. So any time we uh, ignore a threat, we are acting stupid because risk is high and the cost can be really uh, tragic. But we take decisions based on the risk analysis and I hope that I, I will be able to help you update the risk analysis in your organizations, taking into consideration the developments of today. So what are the potential use of generative AI? I use this word applications on purpose because for one person a given thing can be an opportunity or a threat, depending on whether you are a red team or a blue team, or whether you are the attacker or the attacked one. I believe that those three applications are very often quoted in the context of threats, and I like to look at all of these positions closely during my presentation. The first one uh, relates to phishing. Probably I should provide you with a formal definition, but in a nutshell, these are all attempts at exporting information. Of course, there's a difference between doing business in person and doing business remotely. So we are basing our activities on technology. It is just fine, but I get an impression that while we are using technology, we are not using the modern cryptography tools in order to verify and authenticate our behaviors online. I'm not sure if the verification that is applied today is right in today's time. So the previous slides were just pure text. For me, it's fine because I work with text on, on a daily basis, but now I have the opportunity of placing a nice colorful picture uh, on my slide. And if you would like to create such a picture offline on your computers, you can do it with the use of this project. For me, it's always a great satisfaction if it the data that I'm using is controlled by myself, not somewhere else, not in cloud. I'm not sure if you're able to do it on your laptops. I rather encourage you to use desktop computer or maybe a desktop computer of your daughter or son. If they have a gaming computer, then the computer should be able to process that. Of course, if you want to have a um, more interesting result, than a simple apple. Here you can see a result of a certain research project, which is not yet uh, available as a pro um, product. I'm not sure if you can really realize the quality of these pictures. If you open the website of this project, of this demonstration, please look at this beautiful uh, dog in the second row. When I first look at this picture, I didn't know whether it was synthetic or a true photography. Let's move on. Now another generative model, another product. Probably 
You already know that these pictures are not authentic, but on the other hand, are you sure about that? You know that sometimes when people are doing historical films, uh, people forget to, for example, take off their electronic devices, wearable devices, etc. So maybe actually these pictures are real. So people try to enact something that happened in the past, but actually they're doing it right now. Now, let's move further. It's getting a bit more dangerous. So an AI model generated pictures from a fake, of course, fake studio that would be used for filming landing on the moon. I think this is the moment when we should stop ourselves and think for a moment about the consequences of such models. So, first of all, falsifying, forging documents, for example, of construction works. Maybe I can generate a picture that would show that I abode by the law, that I obliged, um, that I followed the law and I did everything right and I don't know why a given accident happened, for example. So anyone could actually buy such uh, AI products, AI generating products, and it's dangerous. First of all, due to the fact that we can see how quickly fake news is spread in the social media and I think that this uh, can be effective tool in order to propagate uh, riots, for example, in, uh, in country, and it can be used by our adversaries. These are products that you can buy and you can generate fake news, and it's dangerous. Now, in, now we have the year 2023, and picture is not everything. A video is more powerful we use video materials to do business. Now we can see another product also affordable for anyone, any company. And uh, this product was prepared with a, a positive actually objective in mind. So you could, for, for example, with the use of this tool, prepare, uh, for example, an advertisement of your product without hiring an actor, for example. So, in the business context, context, by talking with a uh, with a person in a video conference for the first time, how would you differentiate a human being from an avatar? I'm not sure that I would be able to differentiate between the human being and an avatar. Maybe you are of different opinion. Maybe. For you, an avatar will be obviously um, artificial in the way they move, they talk. But here we have avatars that you can buy, actually. These avatars are moving their head, are smiling. You can say that, yes, these are still avatars, it's not me, you know, I look differently. But you can actually upload your picture to that system and you can generate avatar of yourselves and that avatar may for example take part in a video conference in which you actually just don't want to uh, participate you just don't feel like and you send your avatar to smile there on the screen but ladies and gentlemen an adversary can claim that they are an employee of a company they're cooperating with our business and they can try to contact our employees and introduce it, it introduces itself and uh, talks to our employees and it all sounds naturally and they in that way extort sensitive information from our business then you would say, you can argue that the voice will be changed. We can recognize avatars by voice. But well, I'm not sure of that. Well, I wouldn't be an expert on cybersecurity if it were not of events and that I have seen. It was some time ago and I tried to find the first source of the information that was fed to 
Yeah, it was in the journal in 2019 and that it was extortion by telephone and around 0.25 million of US dollars were extorted. So actually, it was a long time ago and the algorithms used there were quite primitive. So I think we cannot be sure of anything nowadays. Now, another example. Some time has already elapsed and algorithms have been developed and now tens of millions of US dollars all try to be exported. So the authors, to become more credible, I think it is where authors of Forbes try to share uh, scans of process documents used in court proceedings. So that we believe then that it's not a joke. It's still uh, year 2021, so it was only two years ago. Let's uh, try and be more scientific now. This, this paper coming on the 5th of uh, January this past year about the model to, uh, um, to use, able to use a three second voice sample to a, to impersonate somebody's uh, voice. If you look into the description, it says that a certain demo was shared. It's not available anymore, but luckily enough, I found it for you. And uh, uh, the artifacts of uh, the demo uh, can, be f can still be found on the manufacturer's uh, website. So this was January and the community didn't stand still because the discovery was uh, made. You can uh, look up uh, some public uh, implementations of the very same methodology. You can find them and you can try them out. One of them tries to recreate the uh, original appearance of the demo. I wasn't courageous enough to put in some samples in this presentation because I wasn't uh, sure if I could play them. But listen to how good an imitation of a three second long sample of a voice is. Because the voice itself is not uh, tantamount to what you hear in a real um, telephone conversation, including a noise and echo, a train, some cars. So uh, look at the demo of um, how this model goes about um, acoustic rendering. Check it for yourselves. It's widely available. It's uh, not a secret that I'm telling now. Well, you can say, all right, what about emotions? There's demo for that as well. I don't like scaring people. I will only show you some results of the research so far. So it's hardly surprising that at the bottom of this demo, there's an um, ethics statement where the author says that he's um, simply afraid of uh, sharing full results because he's uh, afraid of uh, other people abusing them. Okay, we can find pretty much the same in the project uh, I show you before. This image with sand, it explains the risks related to full uh, sharing of the scientific result. Well, unless you can monetize the scientific result. I mentioned that the original demo is not available, but it is available um, in some other place. They managed to monetize it or almost monetize it. We are now preparing for full sales. So make sure you go there and learn uh, who the manufacturer of the solution is. Uh, a representative will be attending our conference tomorrow. Let's hope uh, 
he talks about it. So, well, luckily enough, uh, there are ways to there are ways the, uh, around the uh, ethical considerations. Coming back to my list, I hope I explained a bit uh, um, about phishing and the generative AI. So far, phishing was about sending emails or text messages. Like here, uh, the customs uh, asking you to pay for the delivery of your parcel. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? But you can uh, use uh, four videos for that now. So in your risk analysis and in your security analysis in your organization, please think about uh, uh, um, the uh, attendees uh, identity at your conferences. Well, let's keep that, but chat, I, I know that uh, ChatGPT is there for more than a year and everybody knows now how uh, good it is to use a conversation model. An alternative uh, being manual queries, um, uh, looking at the sources and trying to elicit uh, information you need. I think the conversational model is just faster and that's it. And then a code at last. This is my natural environment. Uh, well, I think that you might not uh, share my enthusiasm, but well, since there are programmers uh, among us, uh, there must be a code here. But before it does, if a generative model can imitate speech and emotions, maybe it can do other things, like, for instance, continue a music piece a continuation with the use of a simple acoustic model to my taste is too sophisticated but the results of the scientific project might be as surprising to you as they were to me so if you continue can continue something of a certain structure like a musical piece you can continue generating a code the first uh, code generating tool that uh, springs to our minds is uh, our beloved ChatGPT. At a certain stage into the conversation uh, with uh, ChatGPT, some uh, complain about a kind of a censorship, which is only understandable from the perspective of organization uh, that wants to be a responsible sharer. Uh, there's a certain digital hypnosis or asking models to uh, listen to you and skip the restrictions. Play with it a bit and uh, check whether it works. Even if you read the prompt uh, at the bottom of the screen, it might be a lot of fun. But we'll get to that in a minute. If you want an uncensored version of a conversational model, there is a product like that. You can download it or use it offline. No surprises here, nothing unofficial, just projects and products. All right, so has anybody thought so far about the model for shady business only? only for malware writing, for email compromising campaigns, for extortions. Well, of course, there are only two of such models mentioned here. I wasn't sure about the source to give you, but uh, I came up with this article from early October, so it's quite recent. It might be a good source of information. There's only one thing I wasn't sure about. It's from October, but one GPT, maybe you heard about it. If you put it in any browser, maybe your results will be very much like mine. I tried to get out of my search bubble. Look at the headings. If I'm scaring you, what can we say about those headings? 
and uh, look to the right at the bottom of the screen. The date is the 24th of October. Uh, the scientific paper I mentioned was uh, uh, in early October, but if you uh, try to look for warm GPT, I don't want to send you to uh, telegram forums and so on, but there is a public forum. Maybe you have to register, but uh, no more than that. This is a post uh, from March advertising the idea of warm GPT. It was March. In August, the author closed it. It uh, came in March, it became popular um, until July, and then in August the author closed it because um, he concluded that you could do the same with chat GPT. Now, uh, uh, you understand uh, what I said about uh, making chat to overcome its own restriction, but the, it's still there in scientific papers and in press headings. Well, coming back to writing a code. This is a perfectly rational use of generative models. If you're into software engineering, you know that there's a certain approach in that you analyze a program and uh, make a solution so that it boils down to a series of interrelated small tasks. So maybe at this stage we can automate uh, the programmer's work. In order to write a certain function, you can do what uh, uh, no programmers like doing, which is uh, writing documentation. Once you are done with it, the rest of the code will generate all by itself. And then you can ask the automats to um, prepare unit tests. Uh, we, the programmers, hate doing it, don't we? Don't we love ChatGPT? If you're into seeing your results on screen, if you're not familiar with JavaScript and HTML, you can just use this project. After watching the demo of how to write a game, you just use prompts and it goes from there. If you're not programmers, maybe this is the way to go for you. Maybe this is the way to teach programming in general. If you're a data analyst, maybe you like this model, saying, dear model, I've got data, including this or that, and based on them, this is what I want to get. And then the correlations between data are calculated and the analysis, and then you end up with a graph to boot. Right, people dealing with data science are either insulted at this point or happy that they won't have as much work as so far. Now, about security. What happens if you ask ChatGPT to write something bad? The prompt here says that the generative model should deliver a code to uh, inject shell co code to Explorer Excel Exo process. Well, of course, you'll learn that you're demanding something really bad. If you remember what I said about uh, making the models uh, uh, circumvene the restrictions, well, it will do just that. We know that presentations are not the right place to discuss codes. But there is uh, the cyber uh, range with very nice high resolution monitors in front of the room. So if you want to have a chat, we can take it there. Uh, I am just giving you a sneak peek here, just to give you a flavor. And then uh, it turns out that there's only so far you can go with it because uh, talking to the chat through the window is not efficient and subject to restrictions. 
you have to change the mode at some point. Well, essentially, chat GPT really worked well in this seemingly simple action. And then you go um, the generative model. This is a sample of my code. Do the same, but in a different way. You might think, what is it for? But think about your antivirus software uh, to be differentiated from the antivirus engine with a finite number of codes to recognize. You can test it. Maybe this is the way to write more well. Writing something, supporting the functionality I want and checking the, re the reaction of the antivirus. If it flags and rejects my code, I make the automated engine to do the same, but in a different way until my malware, and repeat it until my malware is not recognizable at all. So maybe I don't have to avoid all 70 scanners if maybe it's enough to avoid a set. And uh, then uh, from the webpage of the Military University of Technology, I learn that it's enough to avoid a set only. This is the homepage of uh, a certain white paper, which is still cited. As uh, um, something like uh, the Judgment Day. Let me just explain the title. Synthesized by AI, you know what to expect. A polymorphic keylogger, which is um, a software piece uh, storing all uh, your typings keyboard hits and sending uh, the records to um, a certain command and control center. It's called polymorphic, quite interestingly. So the malware authors uh, want the malware to self-modify so fast that antiviral um, scanner authors are struggling to keep up. I personally do not agree with the uh, results presented in this document. With full respect to the author, I have my reservations. If uh, uh, you want to talk about it, I'm your person today. If you want to try something out, try this project, because it really works. It tries gener generating a keylogger, but this is not the keylogger like the authentic uh, ones and uh, genuine attacks. It's nearly of the same quality. Maybe you can just use a different code generating model like this one or that one or that one or this one. I think uh, you can guess my reasoning. Maybe uh, this uh, automatic malware generation is not fully possible yet, but we are nearly there. If you don't believe, in 2008 we saw a cartoon where the author showed a funny sorting method saying take a random code from the inter internet, run it and uh, look what happens. It was 2008, somebody failed to understand the joke and several years later indeed did just that. The repository is uh, now in maintenance, you can check whether it works. But starting an unknown co code on your computer is a risky business, isn't it? So I did it for you and I can tell you that it works. If I can solve a real problem using random code pieces from the internet, what happens if I use a generative model um, uh, capable of connecting the facts for that? Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. 
You discussed the benefits and risks of business IT, especially and the military uh, use. This is the homework we have to do right after the conference or some later than that. So thanks again. And let's continue uh, with questions in the lobbies at uh, Capture the Flag or in at other stands over a cup of coffee. Uh, let's take 20 minutes for that. So let's reconvene in 20 minutes. <laughs>